Why, hello everyone, we're going to get going. Um, welcome to the UBC Learning Circle. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the Learning Circle and, and what we do. Um, we are based out of the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. Uh, we're located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And we are generously funded by the First Nations Health Authority. Uh, the Learning Circle is a program that features workshops on First Nations physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional health and wellness. And we prioritize First Nations knowledge sharing among health professionals, community members, elders, students, and youth. I'm going to introduce myself also. My name is Aurelia Kinslow. I'm the Education Coordinator for the UBC Learning Circle. Uh, I am a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Education at UBC, and my ancestry is Cherokee, Choctaw, African American, Scandinavian, and Ukrainian. Uh, today we are honored to uh, have uh, BCANS, the British Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability Society. Uh, they'll be presenting on uh, National Indigenous Federal Accessibility Legislation. Um, a short synopsis is uh, that the Government of Canada now is currently examining the development and implementation of new federal accessibility legislation for all sectors that fall under federal jurisdiction. The purpose of the legislation is to ensure that persons with disabilities are able to fully participate and contribute in their communities and workplaces without barriers. BCANS is currently engaging First Nation communities, <clears throat> excuse me, organizations and governments across Canada to identify common barriers to accessibility, solutions and possible next steps <clears throat> to ensure accessibility in our communities to present to government. Joining us remotely today is our guest, Justin Brooks. Welcome, Justin. Thank you. Justin Brooks is Wolostokwe from the east coast of Canada on the St. Mary's First Nation Reserve in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Justin has extensive experience working with the federal sector and has a degree in sociology. Justin joined the BCANS team as the Society's Federal Accessibility Coordinator in October 2017. Welcome, Justin. Thank you so much. Um, I, like our facilitator just said, I'm here to talk about the uh, accessibility legislation that's proposed in 2018. I'm just going to begin with the introduction um, with the organization. Uh, we'll talk about some qualitative and quantitative data, and we'll go into the consultation progress. Um, from there, we'll talk about the two specific surveys that exist uh, that we've created here at BSANS, uh, the Government Stakeholder Survey, as well as the Indigenous Community Survey, and then we'll just do a, a conclusion, which is some more, some more data and some more issues and barriers that exist. So if we can get started now. So just to do a little introduction about our organization here. Uh, the British Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability Society, or BCANS, is an award-winning Indigenous disability and health not-for-profit not organization. Uh, BCANS was incorporated in 1991 and is the only standalone Indigenous organization of its kind in Canada. Uh, BCANS delivers a variety of health and disability-related programs and services, including but not limited to Indigenous disability case management, Indigenous Registered Disability Savings Plan Navigation Program, uh, RDSP, First Nations Persons with Disabilities, PWD, Monthly Nutritional Supplement Adjudication Programs, First Nations Health Information, Coordination, Collaboration with Indigenous Federal and Provincial Governments in Relation to Indigenous Disability. Um, our mission is to ad the advancing the unique disability and health priorities of Indigenous persons through collaboration, consultation, and the delivery of comprehensive client services. So uh, just to talk about some of the issues, some of the barriers that exist uh, within British Columbia and Canada. Um, Indigenous persons residing in British Columbia and across Canada continue to deal with the generational effects that European contact has had on all aspects of their lives. It is well documented that the health and disability of Indigenous people in British Columbia and Canada is significantly lowered, lower than that of our non-Indigenous population. The Indigenous population of Canada experienced disability at a rate twice that of the general population at approximately 30%. Additionally, many Indigenous communities are affected by minimal economic and employment opportunities, remoteness, accessibility barriers, 
transportation issues, limited access to necessary disability health and social services and their associated professionals, limited community amenities and so forth, all of which impact their membership's ability to reach their full social and economic inclusion. Demands and expectations placed on Indigenous communities and organizational leadership are high from the membership, with their membership identifying multiple priorities within the community or organization, all of which compete for any available financial resources. Understanding this, leadership within, within Indigenous communities and organizations across British Columbia and Canada are often forced to make difficult decisions in regards to the delivery of programs, services, and specific funding allocations made available. Due to the, complete, due to the completing and ever-increasing community and organizational needs, specialized disability and health support services available may be minimal, with only limited resources provided to the membership. This situation often leads to individuals requiring services and support their families and their support systems with feelings of isolation, frustration, and hopelessness. So if we can just take a moment here and just look at some uh, quantitative data that we've uh, put together and just kind of back up why the legislation is so important at this point. Indigenous populations in Canada experience disabilities as a, at a rate that is twice as high as the non-Indigenous populations at 30%, which was stated previously. Indigenous persons and families face an array of disparities in the areas of disability, health services, social and economic inclusion, accessible communities, inadequate housing, transportation, gender, etc. These disparities have been referred to as a national epidemic by academics and researchers alike. Indigenous persons and families living with disabilities bear the brunt of these disparities while also being faced with additional debilitating barriers such as discrimination while also living with disabilities and being of Indigenous ancestry. Within Canada, there are 619 First Nations communities, 53 Inuit communities, and five provincial Métis organizations. In British Columbia, we have 203 First Nations communities, the highest number in Canada, and 35 chartered Métis communities. According to Statistics Canada, the Indigenous population is one of the fastest growing demographics in the nation. There are approximately 1.5 million individuals in Canada who identify as Indigenous. It can be conservatively estimated that there are more than 450,000 Indigenous individuals living with one or more disabilities, either in or out of First Nations communities, with an estimated 70,000 residents in British Columbia alone. The government, the government of Canada has committed to engaging First Nations individuals living with disabilities through ensuring engagement with remote, semi-remote, and urban First Nations communities. By identifying the barriers that restrict complete social inclusion in relation to Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities for Indigenous individuals and families living with disabilities, st substantial progress can be made in the area of accessibility. The Government of Canada is also committed to creating a clear, communicative and compassionate document that utilizes an Indigenous perspective in order to relay the specific needs and requirements of any future federal accessibility legislation. Federal accessibility legislation will attempt to address specific social issues such as I just want to state that all this information is sourced from the Public Service Alliance and Statistics Canada. One in four First Nations children live in poverty. 23% live in housing that requires major repairs, as opposed to 7% of the rest of the non-Indigenous population. Within First Nations communities, 26% of people living in homes live in homes that are overcrowded. First Nations people still suffer from diseases that are more typically found in developing countries, such as tuberculosis, eight to ten times the national average. One in eight First Nations children are disabled, double the rate of the non-Indigenous population. More than a hundred First Nations communities still boil water, meaning they have no or little access to clean drinking water and sanitation.
the federal accessibility legislation hopes to foster a partnership and networks to address existing and emerging social issues surrounding disabilities. By recognizing and supporting the ability of not-for-profit organization, organizations like BeatCans to identify and address social development priorities and recognize and promote community engagement initiatives that assist with the coming together of community and develop capacities and resources for action. So the consultation progress began in mid-2016, where BCANS and Employment and Social Development Canada have begun initial talks about BCANS playing a role in the consultation progress regarding the new accessibility legislation championed by Minister Qualthro. This partnership was in response to the Government of Canada's commitment to develop new accessibility legislation to promote equality of opportunity and the increased inclusion and participation for all Canadians living with disabilities or functional limitations. As part of the development of this legislation, the Government of Canada is actively engaging individuals and groups through citizen consultation and online survey, surveys across the country. In establishing a strong, clear and representative Indigenous voice, looking to recognize the unique disability related needs and concerns of First Nations people. This Indigenous voice has been made a priority of the government in developing new accessibility legislation. Employment and Social Development Canada has contracted with Indigenous organizations ending in March 2008, sorry, 2018, to conduct federal accessibility legislation consultations across Canada. The British Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability Societies has been chosen as one of the key organizations implementing the consultation process. In December 2016, BCANS and Employment and Social Development Canada, the contract was finalized and BCANS Federal Accessibility Coordinator was hired by the Society and commenced responsibilities beginning this year, January. In anticipation of the contract between BCANS and Employment and Social Development Canada and preceding the implementation of BCANS Federal Accessibility Coordinator, practicum students from the University of Victoria School of Nursing researched, updated, and assembled contact information related to all First Nations communities in Canada. This step was taken to streamline the consultation process for the coordinator. Subsequent orientation to the government's accessibility consultation operation and work to date, extensive document reviews and significant research into current Indigenous issues, policies and practices affecting the Indigenous population of Canada, the Federal Accessibility Coordinator developed two accessibility surveys. These surveys have been and continue to be sent to government agencies and First Nations communities. Here. Okay. Uh, two surveys were designed to gain feedback from the public sector, mainly government bodies and relevant stakeholders, and also engagement with Indigenous communities. So the first survey we're going to take a look at here is the Government Stakeholder Survey. This survey is aimed at engaging with two primary government bodies that provide funding support and policy direction that impact First Nations individuals and families living with disabilities. These are the Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, better known as INAC, and the First Nations Health, First Nations and Inuit Health, Health Canada, and also Obviously, we know in BC, the First Nations Health Authority has taken the place of Health Canada. BCANS has contacted the various INAC and Health Canada regions throughout the nation. BCANS has distributed surveys by email to various INAC and Health Canada employees. The feedback from the public sector employees who work primarily with First Nations was broad, although specific themes were identified. So the first theme is funding and community needs. 40% of respondents indicated that communities and programs required increased funding in order to meet the needs of the membership. This includes funding increases in the areas of programs and services and capital projects. The second theme that was identified is increased coordination and information sharing. 
30% of the respondents indicated that better coordination between INAC and Health Canada and provinces and territories was required to eliminate jurisdictional issues that ensure adequate programs, services, and relevant information sharing with communities. Uh, the third theme that was identified was specialized services and training. 15% of the respondents identified that increased training for government employees to work effectively with communities in addition to increased availability of specialized personnel and services. Uh, for example, occupational therapists, physical therapists, home care, respite care in communities, all services comparable to services available within the non-Indigenous sector. So this is a quote from a Health Canada employee um, who is anonymous who filled out the survey. A major challenge is the jurisdictional ambiguities between many layers of government, local First Nations governments, provincial government, federal government, and even the many different departments within government that generally do not function in a cohesive and coherent way to help support individuals. Second, it is important to recognize that First Nations people already suffer from a huge power imbalance and ongoing structural and overt discrimination and racism, including in accessing care and those First Nations persons with disabilities therefore disadvantaged in multiple ways down to the way in which they are treated and cared for or not by society. Therefore, structural change of policies are needed to promote inclusion of Indigenous person and particularly those with disabilities. And like I said, that was a Health Canada employee. Um, we have another quote here actually from a INAC employee. Uh, so starting the quote, housing on reserve is a national embarrassment and should have increased availability and standards. Disabled people on reserve without their own vehicle are disadvantaged for acquiring basic necessities such as groceries on their own as well as transportation to and from doctor's appointments as well as ensuring they have proper care for after proper care for after procedures Okay, so the next portion will be the Indigenous Community Survey. Uh, BCANS contacted First Nations, on reserve departments, and Indigenous organizations, both through telephone interviews and surveys. To date, BCAN has contacted First Nations communities in most provinces and territories across Canada. Data was compiled from a variety of respondents, and the common themes were identified, similar to the government stakeholder survey. Uh, the first thing that was identified um, was fully accessible communities. 50% of respondents indicated that communities and buildings needed to be built to be fully accessible, ensuring accessible construction being mandated in the community. The second theme is increased training, access to disability related supports and services. 49% of respondents indicated that increased training for staff on what is, available, what is available for persons with disabilities. Also, increased availability of current programs include access to computers and technology, nursing, medical assessment, and respite care. The last theme was transportation. 31% of respondents identified the need for accessible and available transportation for their community members living with disabilities. And we have a quote here from a community member. My granddaughter has disabilities, a trachea and G-tube for feeding, needs 24-hour, seven-day-a-week care and constant air compressor going along with other equipment on an as-needed basis. For instance, kangaroo feeding pump, suction machine, nebulizer, oxygen, etc. It is very difficult for this mother to get out into community to pay, take part in any activities within the community that are social or economical. Okay, we're just going to go into the conclusion. We're going to cover some more information here. Indigenous persons suffer from, oh, sorry. I, I, I just uh, had a yep. question. I, I was wondering, I mean, um, this, this is quite a, a, a dire picture in some ways. And uh, as, as we, as we wait for for federal legislation to 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 change and to hopefully improve 
uh, the circumstances for a lot of disabled people. I'm sorry, disabled people in British Columbia. Um, is there? Uh, do Do you know of of um, programs on the ground that already exist? Just for for those out there who don't maybe know about these programs and and nonprofits. What are, what are some of the things that kind of offer relief already to these communities? Well, these people? yes, that's a great question. Um, there are there is already accessibility legislation that exists. Um, not that doesn't apply to federal sector. Excuse me. So um, the federal accessibility legislation that's proposed. Um, will specifically apply to different federal um, bodies that includes airports, military, RCMP, um, in on First Nations communities because they technically fall under the federal jurisdiction. Um, that's what this legislation specifically is trying to address. So um, there are there are other um, not for profit organizations. I mean, I for the most part, I can only speak about BCANs. Um, uh, the, the, but that's the, what we are one of the only standalone organizations that really address uh, disability issues and barriers. So um, what this legislation would, hopes to do is to take um, to take more of a community perspective to get the input of the people who the legislation is going to directly affect and have their input in making the legislation. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not, but. That's great. Yeah. So, so in other words, there, there's probably very little uh, to offer relief at the moment, and, and therefore it's so important for people to participate in these surveys and give us exactly to hopefully there be yeah large you know federal level changes hopefully yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I continue? Yeah. Okay. So, Indigenous persons suffer from congenital disabilities at close to similar rates as non-Indigenous populations. Indigenous persons have higher rates of environmental and trauma-related disabilities. The disparity between Indigenous and non-Indigenous rates of disabilities are directly related to disparities in rates of injury, accident, violence, self-destruction, or suicidal behavior and illness that often result in long-term impairments. Furthermore, Indigenous persons suffer higher rates of specific diseases, such as type 2 diabetes, which is recognized as one of the most serious chronic diseases among indigenous populations in Canada. Indigenous, in, excuse me, indigenous rates of type 2 diabetes varies from 1.5 to 3 times the Canadian national average. Prevention of disabilities is severely hindered by these startling rates. It has been identified that existing programs and services for indigenous people with disabilities are redundant and convoluted, which may which many individuals just fall to the wayside when it comes to receiving entitled services and programs, including but not limited, re not limited to rehabilitation and support services, which have serious implications for accessing services. The data on indig Indigenous individuals who have disabilities who live in urban communities is minimal and in need of being made a focal point. Throughout history, Indigenous people and those with disabilities have had unnecessary lim unnecessarily limited access to resources and services which result in exclusion from full participation in community life. Limited, restricted access has contributed to a reality where we see high unemployment rates, low educational achievement, degenerative health, poverty on the level of developing countries, and high rates of diabetes. Persons with disabilities fall into a cycle of being bound to becoming long-term recipients of social assistance programs. Welfare, as it's known, carries added social stigmatization, which has become a way of life for many Indigenous people with disabilities. Without recourse for substantial change, they will be destined to suffer a dual dilemma in order to attempt to break free of this cycle of disadvantage they must decide whether to remain within their communities with limited resources, services and opportunities, but where they have kinship support, cultural and community, or decide to choose to move to an urban center in hopes that there will be an enhanced quality of life and provisions of services, but in doing so, lose the support of their community, cultural traditions and identity. Unfortunately, widespread social barriers restrict access to resources, economic opportunity, and social integration. 
indigenous persons with disabilities face the double stigma of not only being an indigenous person, but also being a person with a disability. These barriers can affect every aspect of physical, social, environmental, engulfing attitudes, institutions, language and culture, service delivery, and the power relations and structures of society. The lack of personal input in their lives is an issue that requires immediate attention. People with disabilities have been left out of the decision-making process, either referring to their persons or specific policies that directly affect and control their lives. So what this legislation, what the approach this legislation is looking to do, like I said, is to take the voices and the opinions, the concerns um, of the people that the legislation is going to directly affect. So by taking um, the surveys from the public sector, as well as from community, where they're hoping to get some really good information and be able to make um, really good choices for the people who the legislation will directly affect. Okay, that's it for me. Questions um, at this at this time? Uh, if any of the participants would like to to ask any questions uh, to Justin, please feel free. We're watching yeah. the chat box. Mm -hmm. Was very informative, Justin. I learned a lot from that first time. Oh, thanks. I mean, oh, I, I sorry. Realize, yeah. No, it's um, it's uh, an it's a really good approach. It's too bad that all the legislation that affects uh, Indigenous people couldn't uh, be taken this way, where we you know we have uh, an opportunity to have a voice. Um, but this is a step in the right direction, in my opinion. Um, it's a uh, the excess, you know, we're, we're speaking about a minority group within a minority group who have, you know, a very small voice when it comes to issues such as this. And this is a, a great thing that and a great opportunity for um, our country and for our, all the nations to uh, to make really positive strides towards accessibility legislation and giving a voice to those people who might not necessarily have a voice in most instances. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, so we have some questions coming up here. Okay. Uh, so Leslie would like to know. Um, oh, they're going fast. So I had a question too before yeah. Leslie. Let me just uh, scroll back. Okay, you can at once. First, Sarah, uh, do you know how many community members have been surveyed to this point? Um, yeah, I can answer that in kind of a general way. So we have just released um, an annual report. Uh, the report came out on in March 2017, so this past March. Up to that date, um, there were, I believe, 500 um, surveys that were submitted into First Nations communities and within the public sector as well. But that, that number is, is, is quite, quite more now, a quite large number now. Um, we're not exactly sure, but it's... So um, probably closer to 800, 900 surveys that have been uh, distributed to the community as well as the public sector. Wow. Um, and uh, Leslie is asking where would participants give their input or, or uh, who should they connect to? So how, how can people like, get access to, to yeah. these surveys? Or, or is is it work like that? Is it something that we can just... Yeah, absolutely. Anybody um, can put their input in the survey. So we use um, uh, SurveyMonkey, which is just a free service online. Um, we, um, we contact communities and ask them and give them our information and see if they can engage us. Um, we also take it upon ourselves to get contact information for community members um, from various communities all over Canada. So um, they can contact our organization, go on our website. There's links to the survey right on our website, and they're more than welcome to participate. Okay. Could, could we post? Um, it's already posted. It's already there? Okay. Um, we could, do, do we have a slide with that, that information? Uh, I do not have a slide with our information on it. 
but it, it is um, available on uh, the UBC Learning okay, Survey perfect. page that we put up. Um, yeah. Uh, the next question. Um, someone's giving uh, compliments, um, saying that it's good to see this on the presentation and uh, with the numbers of those with disabilities and those that are not. So again, yeah, we're very thankful for the information. Um, uh, Fiona says, is there a way to have the surveys in hard copy? Are there many people who have no access, as there are many people who have no access to computers and internet? Yes. Um, we, yeah. So for the people, for community members who might not have access to technology, which is a, a big issue right now as well, um, we can provide them with hard paper copies and have them mailed to their home address and then um, they can have them mailed back. We'll just have it like, um, uh, like uh, the postage already paid for. And they can send it back to our organization. Mm -hmm. That's great. Excellent. And then the final question, uh, if, some, if someone else might be typing one, but um, uh, it's a comment. Um, maybe you could speak to, rarely does uh, moving to a larger community mean more services to, for anyone, Indigenous or non-Native? Wait lists are incredibly long, says. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. Um, depending on how remote your community is, um, when you're talking about a flying community in northern Ontario, northern Saskatchewan, northern Manitoba, um, if there is an opportunity to move into a more urban area to get closer to services, um, oftentimes if the opportunity is there, um, they'll take it. I myself, I've worked for Social Development Canada in northern communities for a number of years, and um, you know their situation is dire. They don't have amenities and access to services, specialized services like the rest of the Canadian population who live in closer to ur or urban areas, oftentimes, um, if there is a medical emergency, um, they have to be flown out of their community into an urban center to receive services. So, you know, it's, it's it depending on, like I said, how remote your community is, um, kind of dictates whether or not it's uh, feasible or to their benefit to move into an urban area. But depending on your disability and your you know, an illness of any kind. I mean, that that's that's an option that many, you know, Indigenous and First Nations people have to consider sometimes. Although that is what the statement the person made, of course, yeah, um, wait lists are long and access to medical care, you know, it takes time. But when you're looking at it from the perspective of living in a flying community where there might be a doctor there once a week, twice a week, um, moving to a more urban environment area, seems like a feasible idea compared to what the circumstances are in the community. Thank you. Got a couple more questions being typed out as we speak right now. I'll wait for those. <clears throat> Could you read it out? I don't see this one. Would you be able to contact PAC Provincial Assessment Center services CLBC clients all over BC to stabilize and give care plans. Yeah, um, I can see this the question here. PAC Provincial Assessment Center services to stabilize and give care plans. Um, I'm not sure we have um, disability case managers here that work um, specifically with clients, um, they would be better suited to answer that question than I would. Uh, I just deal with the accessibility legislation portion of our organization. So I can, any questions that I can't answer, I can certainly take the name, get the, get the answer to the question and, and refer back to the individual who asked the question or give it back to you guys and you guys can relay the information. Mm -hmm. We have Gail, Leslie, who are typing questions. And Sarah would like to know, will BCANS conduct the analysis on the two feedbacks or will that... Unfortunately, as much as we'd like to have a say in the analysis of the feedback and the surveys, that will be up to the federal government to do that. I think we're just more of a... Uh, um, a vehicle for compiling the data more so than the analytical portion of it. 
Gail says, one barrier is a lack of training nurses have in completing the PWD assessment form. Um, yeah, so training um, was one of the major issues highlighted in the community survey as well as the private sector and the federal government survey. Um, funding is always the issue, money. Um, but what we would like to, of course, that, that will be an issue that I'm sure will be addressed, but even more importantly, what should be addressed is, is the asset-based kind of uh, strategy where we look into community and see what we can do with the resources that we have until the legislation is passed and there are more funds made available. So that, that's, yeah, that's certainly a concern. I see that you, you answered um, uh, Fiona's question and uh, gave the, the email for the accessibility. Uh, the accessibility email yeah. there. Uh, I, I see a, a prior question from her. Uh, what is to become of all of the compiled information? Will any of it lead to direct benefits for clients? Did you see that one yet? Yeah, well, that's 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 the hopes. Um, yeah, that's the hopes is that you know the uh, the people who are going to make these laws and make this legislation that are going to take into account the indigenous perspective and voice. Um, both from community and from the federal government, peop the people who work in government, who work directly with uh, indigenous persons. So, yeah, this, I mean, that's, that's the hopes that, like I said, that they'll take our, our voices into account, into account and uh, the legislation will be, will be based on our recommendations and our perspectives. And Sarah is having, is typing up a question as well. How hopeful are you that uh, the, the, there will be a, a very inclusive and, and uh, transparent process going forward? Um, it's a question of opinion, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think that this, this legislation um, will use the information that they compiled through the, through the surveys. So BCANS is one of three uh, indigenous nonprofit organizations. Um, that are taking part in compiling the data through the surveys. Um, the federal government has gone above and beyond to uh, make sure that this legislation has, has as much of an indigenous perspective as possible. So I'm very confident that the indigenous perspective and the voices and concerns of community members as well as um, federal government employees who work directly with indigenous populations will be taken into account. That's great. That's great to hear. So our question from Sarah is, does the community survey seek feedback from family, community members that support differently abled individuals as well? Hi, I'm back. Um, oh, there you are. Um, but does the community survey seek to seek feedback from family, community members that support different, differently abled individual as well? So uh, I have to apologize. I'm wondering if Sarah can just be more specific in what she's referring to as a uh, differently abled individuals. We did have a, a question earlier about uh, learning disabilities, I think it was, uh, or a cognitive disabilities. Maybe that's uh -huh. one category we could think about. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so when we're talking about um, cognitive disabilities, physical disabilities, I think they fall all fall under the umbrella of legislation, so um, they will be, they, that will be taken into account as well. No, I think uh, Sarah's adding to that, and uh, John is also maybe typing something. Sorry, Peter, John. Peter John says, I would also like to have a copy for community members to fill in as their needs could be uh, addressed in the future. So we, we provided... Uh, yeah, that's great. Like uh, the, uh, my email is right there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's my direct email, so um, that's my work email, so if they just want to send me all the information and we can get... Great. Sarah says, so looking at if the survey seeks feedback from individuals living with disabilities or if it also seeks feedback from those folks who support individuals living with disabilities. Yes, of course, and that, that, is, that is a very important aspect of, um, of the consultation process. Um, we're not only looking at individuals who suffer from disabilities, but also supports, um, community supports, family members, 
um, anyone who is, whose lives are affected by disability in one way or another, yeah, their, their feedback is more than welcome. And Michelle has a question. She says, how can we support folks with disabilities to access employment in such places as health authorities, i.e. hospital environments, unionized environments? That's a, that's a great question. Um, that's, that's, that's another issue that has to be looked at as well. Um, is employment. Um, employment for disabled people um, is, 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 a, is an issue and is something that needs to be addressed as well. And um, any kind of ideas or any feedback in, to, in, in regards to an issue such as this is, is greatly welcome. Um, we don't have all the answers yet, but through this consultation process, we're hoping to be able to make strides um, in areas such as this. Um, it's important for people with disabilities to be able to uh, have access to the workforce as well, and um, that's, that's, that's certainly a portion that we're looking at. And uh, two more people typing. Leslie says, is, is FNHA connected to this work? Yes, they are. So um, we have, we had, I had shared a couple of testimonials in the presentation. Um, those were, we just used the broad term Health Canada because Health Canada applies to every province and territory except for British Columbia. But yeah, um, First Nations Health Authority is also playing an active role in the consultation process. Michelle added that I am an Aboriginal employment advisor for Island Health and have been interested in how we can support folks with disabilities. Thanks, Michelle. And Leslie says, is there a contact person to speak in communities? Um, the only contact person for the accessibility legislation um, for the for this process is is BCANS. So if um, uh, we're we're connected with um, leaders in various communities across the country, um, they're made aware of the consultation process that we're engaging in presently. Um, as far as if there is a specific contact person, I can't say that there is. Like I said, everything is kind of being uh, spearheaded through BCANS, so. Thank you for that. Maybe one more from Sarah, if you, uh, let's see. Have children and youth been given the opportunity to share their voices? What does the consultation process look like for them? Of course, and I mean, <laughs> Like I said in the presentation, um, there are some startling statistics when it comes to Indigenous children living in and outside of First Nations communities when it comes to disabilities. Um, they have a voice as well. Um, they are more than welcome to fill out a survey. Um, if, if, if it's, you know, there's absolutely no age barrier or um, any kind of barriers to anybody who could fill out a survey and give their input. Mm, that's great. That's really good. There's so many surveys are restricted to people above the age of 18 and whatnot, or, or need a guardian to sign. So that's actually really good news. That's great. We have one more question from Michelle and Sarah. All right. So Michelle says, would legislation potentially help employers get around union rules that may prevent creative hiring strategies? Um, that that isn't a question that I can field at all. That would be uh, more suited to uh, like uh, the Minister Qualtro or her office. Um, I would hope that, that that's not what the use of this legislation is for. It's only my personal opinion, but um, I would I would hope, like I said, that that isn't what it's used for. I would think that the legislation is used, or the consultation process for the legislation is used to get. An indigenous perspective in order to make sure that the legislation is sensitive and compassionate towards those people with disabilities. And Sarah says, in the methodological approach, has there been survey designed specifically speaking to children and youth, i.e. is the language of the survey targeted to children and youth or is it the same survey used for adults? It is, there is only one survey, yeah. Um, um, Sarah has a great point in indigenous methodologies. We always consider the seven generations before us and the seven generations after us. Um, in making the leg in making the survey, um, we wanted to streamline the process as quickly as possible. We were only given um, until March 2018 to conduct the consultation process. So unfortunately, um, the the survey itself is uh, generic. There's only one version of it, uh, but uh, we encourage 
uh, any person who is affected um, by disabilities, either directly or indirectly, to participate. Thank you. And is there one more question from Leslie? Perhaps, uh, could, could you put in your email address one more time in the chat box, please? Thank you. Yeah, Maybe I bouncing. Yeah. There you go. That one should work. All right. Thank you. So um, is there anything more you'd like to share, Justin, about, about this, uh, following up on the conversations we've had with the participants? Um, no, I would just like to thank everybody for participating. I'm sure a lot of the information was a, ref a little bit of a refresher. I know that most of us in this kind of a field understand the disparities and the situation when it comes to disabilities in First Nations communities and in other Indigenous communities. So I just want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, thank you so much for the questions. And um, yeah, I look forward to hearing from anybody else who would like any, any more information on the survey process or the consultation right, thank process. Thank you so much, Justin. It was a pleasure to have you. I uh, wanted to thank you and uh, thank all the participants uh, for coming on today and ask, asking excellent questions. I also want to thank the UBC Learning Circle team, uh, those who have helped with uh, technical difficulties and who are behind the scenes, such as Davina Ridley and uh, uh, Stefan Mladenovic, also assist us with uh, technical issues oftentimes. And my name was uh, Aurelia Kinslow, and I was really pleased to have you all today. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to let you know also about uh, our next sessions. Uh, which uh, are Pathways to Post-Secondary Education. That's happening on Tuesday, October 31st. And on, uh, sorry, and before that, on October 26th, we have Alternative Dispute Resolution Process for Indigenous People. So really hope that uh, you're able to join us for those. And again, thank you so much for participating today. Thank you, Justin. Bye-bye.